Hello and welcome to the Hussa archives at KU Leuven. I'm Julia Janssen and I'm a professor here at the Institute for Philosophy. And I'm going to talk to you about phenomenology. I'm going to try to help you begin understand what phenomenology is and what phenomenologists do. Now, uh, this desk here is the desk of Edmund Husserl, the German philosopher who is regarded uh, to be the father of phenomenology. So he is the one who established uh, phenomenology as a distinct uh, philosophical approach. Look at this desk and try to reflect on your perceptual experience of it. From this, you can learn a whole lot about perception and how it works and about perceptual objects and what they are like. In paying attention to how you perceptually experience the desk or how it is given to you in perceptual experience, you will find that you actually never perceptually experience the desk. If by the desk you mean the whole object in one go. Now you experience it from this angle, now perhaps from that one, and now from a third one, and so on. So Hossa spoke of different profiles in which perceptual uh, objects manifest themselves. You can, think of them of dif uh, you can think of them as different perspectives. You only ever perceive one profile of a perceptual object at a time. And while you may add more and more of these profiles to the first one, uh, as you continue to perceive the object, you can never exhaust all possible profiles of an object. Uh, there always remains something to be seen. There's always more to see, always more to explore and discover. And this also gives you a sense in your perceptual experience that there is an object there that is more than your perceptions of it. Yeah? So the object always transcends any of your experience, any of your uh, perceptions of it. It, the object, is always more than you perceive, while your perceptions, on the other hand, are always partial and necessarily perspectival. However, it doesn't seem quite right at the same time to say that you only experience the sides of the desk, desk that are directly visible to you at a given time. Uh, the ones that you see from your current viewpoint. As you see those sides, you also have a sense that there are more sides to it. That there are sides of the desk that aren't directly currently uh, perceived by you, but that you could see if, for example, you were to move or if you were to move the desk, which is a little too heavy right now. Okay? So uh, all the directly visible sides uh, are not exhausting your perceptual experience, but each of these profiles or sides or perspectives also points to a whole halo of potential uh, uh, potentially visible sides towards which you have certain expectations. You, know, you don't usually think about that, but if your expectations get disappointed, then you become aware that you had expe expectations to these potentially visible sides all along. Yeah? So if I were to walk around this desk and then find out that actually it doesn't have a proper backside, but it's only a dummy, we're lying, it's not a real desk, it's not Husserl's desk, yeah? If I were to discover that perceptually by walking around it, yeah, I would be disappointed and I would realize it would become explicitly um, uh, obvious to me yeah, that I had certain expectations to sites that I hadn't previously seen. So at any given moment, only certain sites of the desk are directly present to, to you. But you know, without anybody telling you, or without you even having to think about it under normal circumstances, that you can move around, that you can perhaps move the perceptual uh, object that you're perceiving at the time, now the desk, 
Uh, and that will mean that what you presently see will not be directly present to you anymore. Yeah? So uh, your perception, in other words, is not just a spotlight on a full object, but it's a continuous process. It's temporally extended, and it has to do also with your own movements and actions. As you turn the desk or walk around it, the potentially perceived becomes the actually perceived, and the actually perceived is again only potentially seen. But there's of course more that you can perceive about this desk, so your perception isn't uh, restricted to uh, the visible sides of the desk, yeah? so you can touch the desk, yeah? you can tap it and hear what it sounds like. Yeah, so does it sound like wood, for example? Does it sound like marble? Does it sound like plastic? Yeah? You could also, I mean, it would be a bit strange if I did it, but you could also smell the desk. Yeah? Wood actually has a nice smell, especially if it's recently polished, let's say. Yeah? So there are other modes of perception, and they also play into what we call yeah, so the complex whole of our perception of the desk. But you can do more in your experience with this desk. For example, you can turn around, yeah? imagine it now, you can turn around until you don't see the desk anymore, and you can try and remember what you've seen. Yeah? You can also uh, imagine the desk in different circumstances. Yeah? You can, for example, imagine, which you're not allowed to to do actually, but you can imagine cutting up the desk and seeing what its inside looks like. You can also imagine yourself being really strong and balancing the desk on your index finger yeah? in your imagination, that's possible, but you're still imagining this desk. Yeah? Or you can also think of it conceptually, you can wonder uh, how old it is or how expensive it is to insure it, yeah? since a since it is a very valuable cultural historical object. Yeah? But these are all different ways in which you can experience the desk or be conscious of it. There are different ways, as Husserl put it, of intending the desk. There are different possible ways in which the desk can become manifest experientially. However, you do not experience the desk as manifest experientially, as perceivable only to you individually. Right? In fact, you'd probably be very surprised if everybody else in this room claimed that they couldn't see the desk. Right? So you assume that what you're perceptually experiencing is not just a private object, but a public one. It's visible to other people. Right? So, you perceive this desk from your viewpoint, somebody else from another viewpoint. Yeah? And in fact, if you were to change places, you could see what they used to see, and they could see what you used to see. Right? So, <clears throat> in fact, I mean, to put it very simply, uh, if you all of a sudden have the sense that you're the only one who's experiencing this desk, chances are you're not actually perceiving it, you're maybe imagining it, or you're having a hallucination of the desk. I mean, it's not perhaps a very interesting hallucination, but yeah. So uh, uh, that speaks to the fact that under normal circumstances, what we mean by perception is actually an experience that we share with other people as well. Yeah? Even if not actually, so even if there are no other people in this room, then at least potentially. And that means that there's also an intersubjective dimension to perception. Now, if you genuinely reflected on how you experienced the desk while I was talking about it, yeah, so if you weren't just daydreaming or merely following my words, yeah, so if you were actually reflecting on your experience, you were already doing phenomenology. You were already engaged in an attempt to describe a perceptual object and to describe your perceptual experience. And together with me, you actually performed a very important methodological step in uh, phenomenology, 
a step that is called the epoche. The word epoche is borrowed from the ancient Greek skeptics and means something like suspension of belief. Yeah? But it doesn't mean that phenomenologists doubt the existence of all objects. Yeah? It's not about doubting that this uh, desk is actually in this room. Rather, it is uh, about trying to suspend our conventional conceptions about objects, our conventional explanations of our experiences, yeah, in order to see, in order to check what they are actually like in our experience, how they're actually given uh, uh, to consciousness. The idea behind it, the critical idea behind this, is that the ways we're used to thinking about the world and the ways we're used to explaining it, for example, by means of science, that that can come to dominate our description of the world so that it becomes very difficult for us to check whether our conceptions and our explanations still refer to something in our experiential world, whether they're actually legitimate, yeah? whether they actually correspond to the world as we experience it. Phenomenologists uh, lead our experience of objects back to how these objects are experienced or how, as they would put it, how they are constituted in consciousness. And they call this leading back the phenomenological reduction. However, when I was describing how Husserl's desk manifested itself perceptually and what that perceptual experience was like, I was interested not in just my experience or your experience or your experience, but I was interested uh, in all our perceptual experiences uh, of the desk and not just of the desk. I was trying to identify or begin to identify the in various essential structures of perceptual experience as such. I performed what phenomenologists call an eidetic reduction. Taking a particular experience as but one possible variation of that type of experience. Taking this particular experience as but one possible variation of the essence, perceptual experience as such. Phenomenologists ask not only what constitutes the experiences of perceiving or imagining or remember, uh, remembering or believing uh, and uh, also the nature of perceived, remembered, imagined and so, so on and so forth objects, but also what it is to love or to hate, what it is to avoid or to fear or to desire, or to calculate, or to explain what it is like to be pregnant, or creative, or sick, or what it is like to become aware of one's mortality, what it is like to be depressed, what it is like to be free, or what it is like to be a victim of oppression. Phenomenological investigations are therefore relevant not only to philosophy, but also to, let's say, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, the political and social sciences, um, uh, and really to any other science that is trying to make sense of the world in which we live, and that in one way or other also makes use of how we experientially are acquainted with this world and how we understand it, not only theoretically but also practically which is ultimately true of all sciences, including the natural sciences and mathematics. Now, although the epoche and the phenomenological reduction and the eidetic reduction, although these are very complex and very difficult notions and there's much controversy, much debate about their applicability, their scope, yeah, uh, although that is the case, uh, I think it is also fair to say that anyone who wants to do phenomenology needs to consider these three methodological steps 
at least in some way or other, at least to some extent or other. But I think when you actually read Husserl's texts, his books, his lecture notes, you might actually wonder how that very technical language could have inspired entire generations of young thinkers and artists and poets to become part of the movement of phenomenology, because that's what it is as well. It's not only described as a distinct philosophical approach, but also as a movement. I think in this regard, one anecdote that Simone de Beauvoir tells us in her memoirs is really telling. So she describes the scene, they're sitting in Paris, it's 1932, they're sitting in a cafe, she and her lover and fellow philosopher Sartre, and they're sitting there with their friend Raymond Aron, and they're talking about politics and philosophy and all kinds of things. And at one point in the conversation, Aron actually turns to Sartre and he says, Sartre, you see, when you do phenomenology, you can talk about this cocktail. And voila, it's philosophy. Right? Now, I think the point of that anecdote is not that phenomenology is somehow trivial or frivolous or too simple. Uh, it's worth remembering as well the context, the historical context of this. So we're talking young people uh, coming out of the aftermath of the, of the First World War, um, heading towards the Second World War, not knowing exactly what is to come, but seeing the Nazi regime rise, rising in Germany and seeing that things are tumultuous, politically difficult, and so on and so forth. So they were inspired by frivolous philosophy. They were inspired by a philosophy or the promise of a philosophy that could do um, philosophy about anything that actually mat mattered to them in real life, anything that actually was at issue and at stake in real life. And that was seen as a liberation of philosophy and as a revolution of thought.